Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to talk about trends in the development of our civilization that lie on the surface, but at the same time remain unnoticed because they are silenced by the media in every possible way. The reality in which we exist is no longer the same as it was a few decades ago. Changes are taking place very quickly and are accelerating like an avalanche. Thus, everyone knows the term biosphere as the habitat of living beings. But few people know and think about the fact that there is also the concept of technosphere. Technosphere is all the achievements of technogenic civilization, from household appliances to food products. Everything that the technosphere comes into contact with undergoes not always noticeable, but cardinal transformation, including man himself. It is not a question of environmental ecology. There is another, but no less serious problem because it, while not yet explicitly revealed, poses a threat to the most valuable thing a human being has, his freedom and individuality. It is a question of the ecology of the spirit, which for some reason few people care about. Attention is diverted to matters insignificant and unimportant, while the world is rapidly changing from the backward, invisible side. It may seem as if nothing is happening. In fact, something is happening. Outwardly, it does not manifest itself in any particular way. Everything seems to be going on, our civilization is following the path of technical progress. In reality, progress, in the form in which its fruits benefit man, has already ended and has moved in the direction beneficial to the technogenic system as a self-developing structure. The system, like a tumor, has begun to actively proliferate on its own, now independently of the will of man. Everything indicates that this process is out of control. When the civilization entered the technogenic way of development, such laws, which previously did not manage manifest themselves in any way, began to work. Now the action of these laws leads to the fact that the technosphere is steadily turning into a matrix. Matrix is a kind of conglomerate, a system, where man is given a role of a battery, powering this system. Movies like The Matrix and Surrogates are not fiction at all, but are very near future. And it's not even about the technology that surrounds us. When people find themselves in the common information field created by all kinds of mass media, they find themselves at the mercy of the system. No longer does man control the system, but it completely controls and subordinates him. In the universal web of information it is easy to do this. Who can benefit from it? No one. Man is simply used to thinking that everything that is said around him happens by the will of some other people. In fact, the system is evolving on its own. Who controls the jungle? Nobody they grow and live the way they are supposed to. Ever since the plants came together and tried to coexist together somehow. But the system benefits from the following. It needs to come to a point of stable equilibrium, to curl up in an optimal structure, where humans, like cyborgs, will maintain its existence. What is required for this? Matrix cells should be filled with obedient elements. And these elements should be, firstly, not quite healthy, so that they have no free energy, and secondly, not quite sane, so that they do not understand where they are. The energy and the conscious will should be enough to properly perform their functional duties, no more and no less. Have you ever wondered why after work many people want nothing more than to collapse on the couch in front of the TV? Fatigue of this kind is common, we're used to it. But is it normal? No. Habitual does not mean normal. Has it ever occurred to you why life of a modern person falls literally into a scissor between 20 and 40 years? No one needs you as a young specialist because you have no experience, and after 40 you are not needed because everything possible has been squeezed out of you. For the same reason after 40 you are not interested in the opposite sex. Again, is this normal? Habitually, yes, but, in fact, something is wrong, isn't it? Well, it shouldn't be like that. Another thing that benefits the technogenic system is a shrinking population. It would seem that a reduction in the number of consumers should lead to a reduction in the returns the system gets from them. But in fact, 
when the system collapses into a matrix, the surviving consumers will become like controlled mechanisms, and society will become totally controllable. This is the purpose and meaning of such a roll-up. Again, the question is, is anyone behind all this? It is now fashionable to discuss fake rumors about a kind of world government, also known as the Bilderberg Club, which includes the richest and most influential people on the planet. But this is just a ploy of the system to divert attention. Many people naively believe that by eliminating this handful of upstarts who secretly intend to subjugate the entire population of the Earth, the problem will be solved. No, it doesn't. If you pull out the tops of weeds from a vegetable garden, do you think they will disappear? The people in power are even more puppets of the system than its rank and file members. The system pulls the strings of the former directly, and the latter indirectly through advertising, false targets, misinformation and other nonsense that the former let them down. In today's society, it doesn't happen that someone plans something global, like a war, and then carries it out on his or her own plan. The banker will not be able to finance such an expansive pleasure unless a suitable grouping breaks through to power, which, in turn, will not break through if the right conditions are not ripe for it. Everything in the system is interconnected and woven together. But the causes should be sought not even in the conditions themselves, but much deeper, where these conditions originate. How are the plans of the system implemented? Very simply, first, by manipulating the attention of the bulk of the people, and second, even more simply, through the food they eat. Attention control is the most effective method of control in general. It is not even necessary to engage in any special ideological propaganda. It is quite enough to make the donkey think of a carrot by hanging it in front of his nose, and he will obediently follow wherever he goes. The principle is that attention is fixed on the information that benefits the system, and the vital issues are diverted in every possible way away from things that are unimportant. There are many examples of how this is done. Diseases are invented that everyone needs to be urgently vaccinated against, while the problem of cancer, which worsens every year, is diverted far away from the key solution. Now very often in the news there is information that a cure for cancer has finally been found. It's even funny, but sad at the same time. And people keep dying. Meanwhile, the original and underlying cause was discovered back in 1931 by Dr. Atta Warburg, for which he received the Nobel Prize. But this was quickly forgotten. The fact that the biosphere has already turned specifically into a technosphere, and what follows from this, is nowhere directly mentioned. Attention is diverted to problems that have not yet arrived and it is not known whether they will arrive at all. For example, global warming, cooling, flooding, 2012, etc. In discussions of the film Avatar attention is focused on visual effects, and the problem of dividing society into followers of technosphere and biosphere, which awaits us in the very near future, is diverted by all means. That is why the Oscar went not to Avatar, but to a movie about American guys who saved the world from aggressive Arabs. This, again, does not mean that the media is secretly steered in the right direction. Everything happens by itself, as it should in the jungle. It is not so easy to attract the attention of the modern man, overfed with information. And what is the easiest way to attract him? That which worries, alarms, frightens. This is how the media works, but not consciously, but at the level of the journalist's instincts. The control is so invisible, so subtle and natural that no one suspects a thing. The elements of the system will be ringed with electronic chips and made completely controllable, like rabbits in a cage, before they know it. Only the chips will not be implanted in the head, of course, this is again a ploy to divert attention. Let the people have a good laugh, protesting against such an inhuman action that deprives the individual of his rights. Everything will be done in a much more civilized manner, for example through driver's licenses or bank cards, without which the rabbits simply cannot exist. It will be clearly explained to them that this is for their own good, convenience and safety. And the vast majority, as always, will believe all this nonsense that they are thrust into, and obediently agree.
It would seem that everything is more or less clear with information. But what does food have to do with it? Can it really be used to control it? Bertrand Russell, the English philosopher and pacifist, wrote long ago that with the help of special nutrition and treatment drugs it is possible to create the type of people who will be as docile as sheep in a herd. Here is a concrete example. In 1974, the U.S. government declared the task of reducing the population in the third world a matter of national security. How was this policy to be implemented? The U.S. National Security Memorandum explicitly recommended, along with provoking wars, the use of food as a tool for population reduction. Long before this memorandum, the system naturally gave rise to such trends as eugenics, the idea of racial hygiene and population reduction. The first tentative experiments of the eugenicists were primitive, inhumane, undemocratic, as we say today, and resonated with the ideology of Nazism and Stalinism. At present, however, all this is done in a more sophisticated, almost elegant, and veiled way, through chemistry and genetically modified organisms, IMO. At first they were developing biological weapons, but then they realized that it was much more effective to act peacefully. Transgenic technology is a genius invention of the system, it kills two birds with one stone. It is both a means to reduce the population and a means to undermine the food security of individual countries, because the seeds of modified plants no longer germinate, and therefore the seed bank is always in the hands of corporations. A perfect method of manipulation. And there is no need to start a war. Just deny the disobedient the supply of seeds at the right time, and do what you want with them. Already many countries are literally brought to their knees. The system is constantly improving its methods. After all, such a primitive policy of eugenics adherence as forced sterilization will of course raise a wave of public protest. But, again, this is just a ploy to divert attention, a kind of bone thrown to the mob. The real methods work invisibly and surreptitiously, adjusting to public opinion and hiding behind allegedly humane goals. Such mimicry always looks reasonable in appearance, for example, genetic modification of plants is necessary and profitable, because it increases the yield and eliminates the need for pesticides. Think about it, is that a bad thing? In fact, this is a myth artificially created by corporations. The facts show that the yield of transgenic plants is much lower, and instead of the former pests and weeds there are others that are not afraid of anything and for which new pesticides have to be invented. There is a dead silence in the fields of genetically modified soybeans, no bird songs or buzzing insects can be heard and there is no movement of life at all as if these plants were made of plastic. But those who have not seen all this are not afraid to eat sausage at all, they do not even realize that GMO ingredients are already added to almost all kinds of food, semi-finished products, sausages, confectionery, dairy products, cereal, chocolate, mayonnaise, sauces, drinks, all the matrix food you can find in the supermarket. They don't even shy away from adding it to baby food. But very few people are aware of this, because all information is carefully hidden. You may ask, are not there any studies carried out? Oh, yes, they are, by order of the GMO producing corporations. The results of such studies are apparently brisk and cheerful, transgens are completely harmless. I guess now hired scientists are working to prove that they are also quite useful. The only independent study was first conducted by Dr. Irina Remikova, a doctor of biology but was soon hastily shut down because it led to shocking conclusions. The U.S. has even passed laws, one of which prohibits the cultivation of fruits and vegetables in their backyards, and the other prohibits the supply of products containing GMOs, with appropriate labeling. In other words, people are already effectively deprived of a choice. Eat what they're given and keep your mouth shut. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? The most interesting thing is that the US government, or world government, call it what you will, policy against the third world has had unintended consequences for the US itself. One third of America is already barren. Another third of America is exorbitantly obese. 
30 years ago, it was a running nation, obsessed with organic, natural, foods. And, again, a third of them are on antidepressants. So that's a simple and straightforward statistic. And everyone around us naively and carelessly assumes that this is normal. No one is surprised that chronic fatigue and stress syndrome has become a norm of modern life. And it is also supposedly normal. Where did such striking changes come from? Doesn't anyone care about bioproducts anymore? The reason is very simple, synthetic pauperism, especially fast food, which is most widespread in America, is addictive, no different in principle from narcotics. The entire population of the world already consists of hardened poofters. Another simple statistic, over the past few years, a third of the bees have died. No one knows exactly why this is happening. Probable causes, electromagnetic smog from cell phones, transgenic plants, chemicals, or possibly all of the above combined. What does this mean no honey? Not tea, much worse, no plants that are pollinated by bees. And three quarters of them, at least. In some provinces of China, bees have been wiped out completely by pesticides, and now cultivated plants there are literally pollinated by humans, by hand. But no one cares about this problem. Everyone is preoccupied with the myth of 2012, which the Mayans invented a long time ago. It's all very sad. Man, imagining himself to be the king of nature, has launched an arrogant and destructive drive to remake the unique biosphere, which has been created over millions of years. Do you see what's happening? It's like letting a monkey into a chemistry lab. And whatever this monkey may be doing, no matter how scientific or super scientific, will end up in a catastrophe. The main point I want to make clear is that we are not ruled by specific individuals, we are simply stepping unknowingly and amicably into a matrix, where there will be total control of the system. All of this is happening under the auspices of democratic and humanitarian transformation, under the auspices of cooperation, peace, the salvation of humanity, etc. Man, enslaved by the system, loses not just freedom of choice, he begins to want exactly what is beneficial to the system. And this process is initiated and directed not intentionally, but occurs by itself, in accordance with the laws of self-organization of the parasitic system, that is synergetically. Very few people see and understand this. The gentlemen of the Wild Elberg Club may imagine that they can control something, but that is a mistake. The system will swallow them too, and them in the first place. The situation has long been out of control. Although they may have realized it, because they are certainly not stupid people. So, the new reality is not the same as before, and the rules of survival in it are no longer the same. We woke up in a different reality. Civilization has made a sharp view turn from the natural nature of man toward a technogenic society. And this has a very strong effect on people, they are no longer so much free individuals as elements of the system, much of whose energy and consciousness is under the control of the system. The technogenic system, in its essence, is absolutely destructive both with respect to the biosphere of our planet, and for man, his abilities are blocked, his opportunities are sharply reduced, so that he does not interfere with the system to develop as it needs. But man sees and feels nothing of the kind, because the operation is performed under general anesthesia, in a state of deep sleep, of which the patient, again, has no idea. Life in the technogenic system is built in such a way as to blur the consciousness, and to divert attention away from the real state of affairs. A man in the matrix does not see the reality as it really is, does not understand where all the what why and why comes from. He lacks vision, which is simply swaddled. How is consciousness clouded? Very easily. Recall the tale of Sinbad the sailor from a thousand and one nights. One day the travelers arrived in a country where the locals greeted them very cordially and began to feed them delicious food. The travelers ate this food for many days, and gradually their bodies turned into fat carcasses and their minds became clouded. They stopped evaluating reality objectively, 
As it turned out, they were being slaughter fed. I keep repeating that there is no such thing as fairy tales and fantasy, it is all aspects of our reality that have been or will still be realized. What we let into ourselves directly that is, food, water, and information serves as a direct tool to suppress the clarity of consciousness. When one eats natural bean and drinks pure water, consciousness is very tangibly clarified it has been tested. How is attention withdrawn? Lately you might have noticed that people are showing pronounced signs of distraction, forgetfulness, inattention. Very often you can witness as if attention is limp. People make elementary mistakes, get confused about simple things, and perform inadequate actions. It feels as if a large part of a person's attention is captured by someone or something. It's like with energy, if a person is sick, the lion's share of his energy is involved, distracted to fight the disease. Or if a person has taken on an overwhelming load of obligations, much of their free energy, again, is blocked, reserved for those obligations. In my earlier books I wrote about attention grabbing by the pendulum, when a person, irritated, anxious or frightened by something, seems to fall into a stupor, sinks into his problem, as into a dream, and stops seeing and being aware of what is going on in his reality. But back then I did not describe it as a mass phenomenon. Now there is clearly a mass phenomenon. People are overwhelmingly asleep, that is, they literally act as if in a dream not controlling their own lives, but life happens to them. I view this phenomenon as an alarming sign, because just two or three years ago it was not yet so pronounced. There is one simple illustration of the attention-grabbing effect. When some company goes out into the countryside, what's the first thing done? The car doors are opened and the radio is turned up to full volume. It seems strange, but instead of taking a break from the noise of the city and listening to the quiet of the forest and the singing of the birds, the same drumming on the brain is turned on. Maybe all of us are such fans of music or fresh news. Compare a modern person and someone who lived a thousand years ago, when there were no newspapers, movies, radio, television, internet and cell phones. They are completely different people. And the main difference is not even in the level of intelligence, civility, or education. The point is that modern people are hooked on information, because they can no longer do without the external flow of information. Of information. It is this flow, created by the system, that creates the attention-grabbing effect. It may seem to you that you are completely focused on what you are doing at that moment, but in fact, only a fraction of your attention is active. Most of it is connected by an invisible thread to the information web of the system, reserved for external control flow, like a safe deposit box in a bank. And another, no less significant part of the attention is blocked, in a state of hibernation. Synthetic food induces this blockage, as does any other chemical product that induces an altered state of consciousness, to a greater or lesser degree. With the appearance and development of man-made methods of food processing, the situation has become more and more aggravated every year. For example, a peculiarity of the psyche of modern children, namely hyperactivity and attention deficit, is used to write off on the phenomenon of indigo. In fact, indigo has nothing to do with it. Hysterical behavior, which is now common in children from a very young age, is due to the high content of chemicals and synthetics in supermarket foods. Synthetic food is as toxic as alcohol or drugs. So much for a rattled nervous system. Such a child is chattering like a weather vane in the wind. He has a hard time learning, can't concentrate and can't sit still. In my day, when we were pioneers, we could sit still. My generation still remembers how we could even be made to sit with our hands folded on the desk. Why can't today's kids? Their moods and energies are constantly changing. So how are they different from those pioneers? from us. We were frantic too, but we could concentrate, easily. Now, I would say, kids are no longer mad, which, in fact, they should be, but rather tired. One summer I was walking along the beach and saw a large group of children, apparently from a children's camp. 
They had just been brought in, undressed, and allowed to go into water. I braced myself for the fact that I was about to have to walk through a chaotic, crazy crowd of screaming, running, jumping, leaping monsters. Not so. They acted like pensioners after a heavy lunch. And that is taking into account the fact that the sea usually gets kids excited. Of course, all children are different, and the effect of chemistry on adults is not the same. But the overall picture is unambiguous, intoxication with dead synthetics, with all the symptoms that accompany this intoxication, and which have already become normal. It is believed that this is normal, because, according to the principle of society, if everyone has it, then it must be so. But does it have to be this way? Synthetic products are addictive to humans akin to narcotics. The growth of degenerative diseases, for example, correlates statistically with the emergence and development of new cooking technologies, such as canning, refining and all kinds of chemical processing. Food technology has evolved not for reasons of utility, but on the principles of tasty, practical, fashionable, everyone does it. First cereals and rice were invented to peel the shell and germ, which contained just enough of the most valuable. Processed grain products became white, tender and fluffy. Someone once came to visit someone and saw, what puffy buns, what snow white rice. How great! I want one too. That's what everyone wanted. And then they got used to it. But they started getting sick. But it never occurred to anyone to link the emergence of new diseases with changes in food technology. Almost nobody. And to this day, very few people think about it. They eat and they get sick. They get sick and they eat. Interesting fact, in medieval France, the home of sophisticated cooking, a big bowl of green salad was the main and daily dish of the common people. The common people ate an unpretentious natural niche. Culinary extravagances were considered the privilege of the nobility, for whom the cooks tried to prepare something special, while they themselves, sitting in the kitchen, ate a bowl of salad of all kinds of herbs. It was customary to add the same herbs to the master's dishes only as seasonings and garnishings. At that time sickness and all sorts of ailments were a characteristic feature of the noble family. It was even considered fashionable to have a pale face and lie in bed all day, languishing from the high society moping in sickliness. Such was the fashion. And on the contrary, a tanned, healthy, simple look was a characteristic feature of the lower class, you know, you don't have time to be sick. And I've got plenty of energy, too. It was a common thing to toil all day long, and after that it was easy to make nice afterwards somewhere in a haystack. In time, however, sophisticated cooking spread everywhere, largely thanks to the same fashion. For example, canned food was invented to provide Napoleon's army with practical rations. But then canned food simply became fashionable as one of the achievements of progress. Imagine people sitting at a table served with all sorts of canned goods. And even the conversation at the table was about canned food, and what cans did you eat today? We're like this and this. What, you don't eat canned food? You are completely out of touch with life. At first, the technology of canning was limited to a long heat treatment. But later invented all sorts of preservatives, flavor enhancers, flavorings, additives, fragrances. Not only do people get used to this kind of food, but it creates a strong narcotic dependence, an attachment to the prof. And most importantly, it turns out that it is convenient for everyone, producers, traders and consumers alike. Everyone is sitting on the same needle and gets their own benefits. But then again, they eat and get sick, get sick and eat. It seems as if modern man is not homo sapiens, sentient man, but a domesticated, domesticated and deliberately fed species that has absolutely no idea what it is being fed into what end. Homo matsuitas. Someone's pet, on a human farm. The system has a vested interest in making sure that everyone walks in one line. And that formation is especially easy to manage if everyone is tied to the same trough. 
and it is also easy to manage this formation if everyone is striving for the same surrogate goals and afraid of the same problems. Look into any mass media and you will clearly see an absolutely primitive picture, on the one hand, from all screens and covers we are imposed a cult of success and consumption while on the other hand we are simultaneously frightened by alarming news. This is how the line holds up. Perhaps the most terrifying side effect of man-made civilization is degenerative diseases and the early deaths associated with them. Chemicals, radiation and GMOs are not felt, but they kill real, only slowly. It is a slow death. And it is the way of death, not life. You have to be very naive to think that all these synthetic conveniences Conveniences will pass for nothing. We're not androids, are we? For some reason, we are always impressed by the death of a famous person, especially if he was very successful in life. But few are impressed by the overall statistics, which always remain as if in the shadows, behind the scenes. And the statistics are as follows. In Russia, 300,000 people a year die of cancer. In the US, half a million. The population of a small country. Imagine, every year, within each major state, an entire country dies out. From cancer alone. And every year these numbers increase significantly. And recently there has been a noticeable rejuvenation of the disease. 40% of the European population, according to New Scientist magazine, is already recognized as mentally ill. Hard to believe. But when you consider that depression, for example, has already grown to pandemic proportions, there is nothing to be surprised about. Allergies, arthritis, problems with the spine, these two are mass epidemics. Only in Russia for the last 20 years alone, 800,000 people have committed suicide. So in Russia on the average 40,000 people a year pass away not because of illnesses, but because they think that further life is simply unbearable. But the starting mechanism is not life's difficulties but rather the depression resulting from food intoxication. 37,000 people die of hunger every day. Every five seconds a child dies of hunger. We were once promised that GMOs would feed all of humanity. However, the introduction of GMOs has not only failed to cope with this problem, but has resulted in widespread infertility, the ruin of farmers, and the death of pollinating insects, which on the chain can lead to catastrophic consequences. These are the statistics of today, which are not widely publicized and remain under the radar. But the important thing is not even what the numbers are, but that all of these diseases are degenerative. This means that the body literally crumbles, degrades under the onslaught of unnatural and aggressive environmental conditions. The main idea, which is not usually mentioned, is that all these diseases, including suicide, have their origin in purely man-made processes. In the history of mankind, before the wide introduction of the technosphere into all aspects of life, especially in food technology, there was nothing like this. Unfortunately, I cannot cover all aspects of the technosphere's harmful effects in this short lecture. At the end of the topic, at the risk of exhausting your patience, dear listeners, I would like to mention one more factor of the technogenic system, which has a very strong, though imperceptible influence on man, radio radiation from cell phones and network antennas. Here there is already a real threat to the brain tumor as a result of constant exposure to electromagnetic radiation. Phone manufacturers and network operators know this, but they do not care, they are too busy chasing profits. Phone users are either unaware of this or in a state of so-called herd safety. After all, everyone is using their phones. Can everyone not feel threatened, can they? I give you the unpleasant news, they can. Man is able to remain in a carefree euphoria, not paying attention to the warning signs, for as long as it takes until the disaster touches him personally or until it becomes obvious that the entire herd has been fed to the slaughter. Such an example might be given. Until the 80s of the last century, everyone enthusiastically welcomed the advent of the cheap asbestos-based building materials. No one paid any attention to the warnings of specialists about the carcinogenic properties of this mineral, and asbestos manufacturers then profited very well. And then mass cases of tumors began. 
But the asbestos industry is a multi-billion dollar business, and manufacturers have long been able to lobby their interests, trying their best to prove absolute safety. Now asbestos is completely banned only in the countries of the European Union. In the rest of the world it is not. So the asbestos war is still not over. Why not? The time has not yet come. The fact is that tumors take a very long time to develop, about 35-40 years. If we consider that the peak of asbestos use was in the late 70s and early 80s, it is easy to see that the peak of tumor disease is still to come, from the 2015s to the 2020s. The clockwork is still ticking. Obviously, the consequences of widespread cell phone adoption will begin to surface sometime in 2035. No one knows what these consequences will be and on what scale. The worst thing is that this is a global experiment, and it is conducted on all mankind. And since electromagnetic radiation, among other things, entails genetic changes, we can assume that the MAD experiment is conducted not only on the current, but also on the future, not yet born generation. Are you willing to wait 20 or 30 years to see what the consequences of this experiment will be? Imagine what will be in 30 years. What will our planet to be like? Which of us will be left? What's in store for us, a sci-fi blockbuster with almost no clean water or proper food anymore? Will it be an overpopulated world with battles over water and food, or maybe deserted streets? This is not only a question of the ecology of our planet, but also of our personal ecology. We can't help for someone to sort things out. And we don't have time to wait. We want to secure our personal ecology here and now, not in the future, when producers and traders finally understand what they produce and what they sell, and when doctors learn how to treat disease. I take this opportunity to speak on behalf of Russian biosphere activists. We proclaim the Clive Convention to unite all who seek to preserve the ecology of our planet as well as our personal ecology. The combination Clive is formed by the prefix C, from the word convention, the German root Lieb, love, and the Latin liber, free. Also, Clive is an abbreviation of the Russian phrase the concept of personal security and freedom. In a man-made system, it is high time to talk about personal ecology, personal security and freedom. In 2009, the General Assembly of the United Nations, within the framework of the concept of sustainable development, sustainable development, adopted a resolution in which organizations and countries participants were invited to consider the problem of promoting life in harmony with nature. We support this resolution, but we want to go even further, so that the principle of living in harmony with nature becomes not only an issue of ecological security at the level of states, but also at the level of personal security for everyone. If one does not take care of one's own personal safety, one can hardly count on the help of the state. The concept of sustainable development has been around for many years, but nothing has changed, has it? On the contrary, the situation continues to worsen. We are not calling for confrontation. Fighting against a system dominated by the race for profit is like fighting windmills. It is possible to live in the system to enjoy its benefits and at the same time be independent of it and protect yourself from its harmful effects. This requires requires knowing the rules of safe existence in a technogenic environment. First of all, it is necessary not to forget our biosphere origin, not to lose the remnants of natural nature and ourselves and our environment, not to let ourselves be involved in the process of universal cybertization, not to turn into a matrix cell, but to do everything to preserve our individuality, freedom, consciousness, health, as well as the biosphere around us. The task of the Clive Convention is to inform people about the rules of safe living in a man-made environment and to unite the adherents of the biosphere. And it is our task to choose to be environmentally friendly. It's very simple. We can't break the system, but we can prioritize natural products and services. As you know, supply meets demand. First, reject foods that contain GMOs, chemicals, synthetics, and additives that mimic the supposedly natural. We should strive to minimize the presence of chemicals and synthetics as much as possible. There are and will be alternatives if there is demand for them. 
Secondly, use the cell phone for its direct purpose, as a phone, or, when necessary, turn off the radio mode. Take it in your hands only when really necessary, keep it away from your body, and especially away from your head. The only effective way to avoid direct radiation to the brain is with a headset, headphones and a microphone on a wire. It is on a wire, not by some other radiation. Third, to consciously dose the incoming flow of information, as well as one's direct participation in the universal information web. Many more alternatives could be proposed, but even these elementary measures would be enough to make significant changes in our lives toward the biosphere. If we combine our efforts, we can create a biospheric oasis in a man-made system. Personally, I am convinced that the biosphere and the technosphere can exist in equilibrium when the system works for man and not man for the system. Let's take care of our fragile planet, ourselves, and our children. Thank you for your attention.